it was over a month ago that God pressed on my heart that, I, that we would have a, a service to reflect and to renew our commitments to him. And so later on, we're going to take offering. Later on, we're going to take communion. But first, we're going to let God do some work on our hearts and minds. And, and we're going to spend some time in worship again. And like I said, you'll be able to come up here and, and hang out with God and talk to him. And I uh, just want to welcome all of you here. I know if you're a guest, this is a different type of service again. And, uh, you know, I just want to be obedient to what God wants us to do. And, um, you know, we don't have to have a cookie cutter service all the time. You know, I just really, God really pressed on my heart that we just always leave room. Amen. Yeah. So, I do need to give you guys a note that last week was overwhelming. It was gracious, the celebration for our church. Uh, pastor wants to extend his gratitude and he sent a note and says this, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the pastor appreciation and retirement blessings that were bestowed upon me and my family. Words cannot be found for the gratitude I felt for the myriad of stories and comments given. May God continue to bless this fellowship for, the, for this kindness, for the kindness and support of all these years. We love you. God bless you. That's a note from Pastor Kuhn to you saying thank you. It was overwhelming, the love that we felt as a family. So thank you so much for doing that. And we just want to praise God for that, too. If you thank you, God. Thank you. So you heard my heart already as I was praying. You know, I just felt that God was prompting us to start off this new season with renewed hearts and minds for God. And something that God's been put on my heart is to keep him as my first love. My first love. You know, sometimes church can become, in a sense, for a pastor, more important, like the church activities and the work and the ministry and God struck my heart on the way home from General Council in Florida when I was at an AG event, some of God event, and he said, keep me as your first love. And I want you to know as a pastor, I seek to live a life that is in tune with God. I seek God uh, to show me anything I need to repent of and, and ask forgiveness for. And I seek God to... To, to really show me where I can renew myself and, and really be in tune with him. And this past week, I just told God once again, like I did years ago at college before I left for ministry to coming to Dover, I told God, um, God, use me. Here am I. I rededicate myself to be used for your glory. So as a church, last week was beautiful. We got to commit and say we will but here we get to actually act that out in our service. And, and so I wanna go through three different focuses. And the first one is remembering what Jesus has done for us. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Luke 7. And I'm gonna read for you Psalm 103. There's verses in your outline today, but I gave you the references. But as you're turning to Luke 7, go to verse 36. I wanna show you what Psalm 103 says. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So we remember today all the benefits we have because of God's grace and love. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your mouth so that your youth is renewed like the eagles the lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed he made known his ways to moses his deeds to the people of israel the lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger abounding in love he will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever he does not treat us as our sins deserve amen or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great his love for us, for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. 
Wow. So today we're remembering what he has done for us. In Luke 36 through 50, there's a story that really, really impacted me this past week. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman, she was a prostitute, from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, to the woman your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. First of all, if you're in this room and you feel like you are unworthy of being loved and forgiven, you are wrong. God loves you. And he's calling you home. His love is great, greater than our sin. And as a church, let's not forget how gracious God has been to us. How much debt we were in because of our sin did you know that there's nothing we can do to pay our way out of it? There's nothing we can do. There's no money. There's, there's nothing that we can amass to even attempt to be forgiven by God. That's why he gave us his son, Jesus, to do it for us. That's humbling today to think. So after I share these words today, we're going to be able to come up here or around the room and we're going to be able to remember what God has done for us. And the second thing I felt prompted to do is that we focus on any kind of repentance that we need to have for our lives. And there was a story in 2 Kings 22, and I want to read this to you, and thank you for being patient as I read the scripture, because it really hit me with a kind of heart that I want to have all the time and the kind of hearts that we should have as the body of Christ. It's a story of Josiah in 2 Kings 22. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. That's something, isn't it? And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah from Vascoth. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. That's so key. In the eighth year of his reign, King Josiah sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, and grandson of Meshulam, the court secretary, to the temple of the Lord. He told him, go to Hil Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him count the money the gatekeepers have collected from the people at the Lord's temple. Entrust this money to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of the Lord's temple. Then they can use it to pay workers to repair the temple. They will need to hire carpenters, builders, and masons. Also have them buy the timber and the finished stone needed to repair the temple. But don't require the construction supervisors to keep account of the money they receive, for they are honest and trustworthy men. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of law of the law in the Lord's temple. He's referring to the, 
the book of Moses and the Torah and the commandments. They had found it. It was lost. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan, and he read it. Shaphan went to the king and, and reported, Your officials have turned over the money collected at the temple of the Lord to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. And so he read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the book of the law, so when Josiah heard what was written, he tore his clothes in despair. Then he gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest. Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah. Inquire about the words written in the scroll that has been found. For the Lord's great anger is burning against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words in the scroll. We have not been doing everything it says we must do. So Hilkiah the priest and many other names went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet Fulda. She said to them, the Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you. This is what the Lord says. And this is interesting. I'm going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the words written in the scroll that the king of Judah has read will come true. For my people have abandoned me and, and offered sacrifices to pagan gods. And I'm very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will burn against this place and it will not be quenched. But go to the king of Judah, so go to Josiah, who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you've just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I said against the city and its people, that this land would be cursed and become desolate. You tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until after you have died and been buried in peace. You will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on the city. And so they took this message back to the king. You know what happens next? Is he goes throughout Jerusalem and he clears out every possible idol or false god that there is throughout Jerusalem and Judah. And there were a ton. The entire chapter of 23, they take time to cleanse everything. And what's terrible is there was even a God named Malek that they would sacrifice children to. That's how bad it was. And when I read this, I just thought, God, search me and know my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me. Because here's the reality. In the New Testament, we are now the temple of the living God. Did you know that? Now we are the temple of the living God. God dwells in us and among us. And so maybe there's something in our lives today that we need to let God sweep out. And what's interesting is, is when when Josiah did this, when he repented, now we don't have to tear our clothes off or anything. That was something they did culturally at that time to show that they were repenting. But what Josiah did was he turned his heart back to God. Repentance is to return to God and to turn away from sin and to return to God. And what did he find? He found a merciful God. He found a gracious God. Not one who was going to shame him or condemn him or embarrass or hold this over him, but instead he found a God that forgave and corrected his path and restored him. That's the grace and mercy that we have today. If we come to him, and I, you know, I have to read uh, Psalm 51, a few verses. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I would teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. So a spirit that is repentant. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. Oh God, I love that. He won't reject us today as we repent. The difference, though, between confession and repentance is confession is to say or admit that you have sinned, but repentance is an action. It's not just to say something. It's to actually change the direction that you're heading in. 
So in chapter 23, Josiah literally took a new direction for Jerusalem and Judah, and he began to get rid of things in their cities that would interfere with God blessing them. And so we too as people, we too as people of God have to look at our hearts and go, God, is there something that I need to not only just admit I'm wrong in, but something I need to remove out of my life that I need to, I need to turn into a new direction? Why though? Because God is love and he loves us. And also God wants to do great things through your life. And I, I, want, I want to be a conduit of God's power and grace, personally, and for our church to be one as well. And so I don't want anything to block us from moving forward individually or as a church, amen? And so today we'll have a chance to seek God and say, God, is there anything that's in the way? And here's what 1 John 1, 8 through 9 says. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, this is beautiful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. He loves us. He loves us. And so lastly, we rededicate ourselves. In Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, for the grace of God has been revealed, which is Jesus, revealing or bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with the hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people. And I love this, totally committed to doing good deeds. You know why we're reflecting and renewing our lives today? Because God was so loving and so gracious that he would come from heaven in Jesus Christ. Just think about that for a second. A holy God who you could not approach unless you were Aaron the high priest and went through tons of ceremonial cleansings and only one person one time a year could go into the inner holy, most holy of holy areas where God's presence is. Only one person, one time a year. That God said, I'm coming to them. I'm going to come down and I'm going to walk among them. And that God is Jesus. And Jesus was letting a sinful woman worship him at his feet. about that for a second. Think about that for a second. She was known as a prostitute. She comes to worship Jesus better than those who knew better. And Jesus forgave her of all her sins. The God, the holiest God of the world, the only God, right? The whole, holy God and he is letting a sinner touch his feet and worship him. There is nothing that we have done that God cannot forgive. And that kind of love makes me want to remember, repent, and then renew or rededicate my life to him. So that's what we're going to do here in the next few moments as a church. We're going to sing some songs together. We're going to pray and let this room be a, an altar unto God. And let this be a time where we can rededicate and offer our lives once again to worship him. Amen. Would you stand with me as we worship? And I'm going to pray. And we'll be up again here to take communion and to take our offering at the end. God, we are humbled by your scripture. We are humbled today. 
by your love for us. Lord, do what you want to do today. We come to you with gratitude. We come to you with gratitude. And we come to you with humility to say, continue to cleanse us. Continue to show us things that need to go. God, we confess and we repent of things that are blocking your blessing, that are blocking us from advancing in your will and purpose for our lives. And God, we rededicate ourselves to worship you with our whole self, to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We thank you, God. We worship you in Jesus' name.